can see the slides, everything fine. Yes, we do. Yes, okay. we do. Great. It's good. Thank you so much, Professor Becker, for inviting me to give this talk. Thanks, uh, Dr. Yasmin, for the organization. So, uh, and thanks for the introduction in case uh, you miss it. So we had some technical issues to share the slides, but finally we get it to work. So yeah, I'm Mohamed Alser. I'm from ETH Zurich, Switzerland. So today I'll be talking about analyzing genomes via efficient hardware software co-design. And uh, I'm part of Safari Research Group here at ETH Zurich, uh, Department of Computer Science and uh, Department of Electric Engineering as well. We are a very large group led by Professor Ornor Mutlu. We are located in the beautiful city of Zurich. Uh, we don't have actual campus, but we have several buildings scattered uh, along the city. And uh, I think I will, I will not go through this slide. Uh, Professor Becker did a good job introducing me, so I'll skip it, but I will share the slides so you can have more details. And basically I use Twitter in case you want to follow me or just uh, sh uh, get some news about bioinformatics, genomics, or our courses, as well as our research activities. Okay, so let's get to the topic. What is a genome? In case you don't know, what is a genome? So if we look at this picture, you will see really different faces, different people, different individuals that you can really observe these differences without doing any effort. You can see different skin color, different hair color, shape, body mass, and so on. So what causes all these differences? And that is what is our genome. It's really a genetic instructions that make us. So an organism complete set of genetic instructions. And this is how it looks like if we convert into computer science problem. So you, as you know, the DNA or RNA or our genetic material is really chemical molecules. For example, in the DNA, we have four chemical molecules. These are the key components of our DNA. Um, for example, the A represent adenine, then the G is guanine, then the C cytosine, and T is thymine. So if you convert each of these chemical molecules into a DNA alphabet, you'll get these four characters, A, C, G, T. And if you print them on a stack of paper, you'll get something like one sixth the height of a Khalifa Tower. And this is a huge workload to be processed. And if you ever wonder about the other species, how large their genomic material, for viruses, normally it's very short, like few thousand. For bacteria, it's a few million, and for human, is like 3.2 billion characters, and we're still discovering more. We never get there yet, although we are studying the full genome since about 22 years or more. I think 10 years before that, we started to sequence the full reference genome, and then 10 years or 13 years later, we got the fir first reference genome, and then 20 years after that, we start to get it near complete, but we never get it the complete sequence. And even with that, we still, we don't have the reference genome that represent a population. If we talk about fruits, vegetables, it's way longer than what we have. It could reach up to 50x longer than human genome. All right, so how to analyze the genome? First, we want to get the genomic material and convert it into this computer science text so you can analyze it and perform some algorithm modification or hardware processing. Unfortunately, we don't have any machine that you give it a genetic material and will give you the complete sequence of your DNA. So what we have is that you need to go to the pharmacy or the lab, hospital, or supermarket even to buy one of these cats where you do the swap yourself and then you ship it back to the company. The company will have one of these machines, what we call sequencing machine. It could really vary in size, can be handheld size or it can be fridge size. Sequencing machine, they differ in throughput, price and so on, as well as the accuracy of the machine. So each of these machine introduce its own error while we are reading our genome. However, all have something in common which that regardless of the sequencing machine, the, the output of this machine still lack information about their order and location. We really don't know which piece coming before what, what other piece. So we got segments of our DNA. It could be really short, could be really long, but still we don't get uh, the, the full genome. 
uh, I got the notification that there are people waiting. Uh, maybe someone can accept them in the meeting. Yeah. Yeah, Yasmin will uh, take care of that. She will accept them. Thank you. You can focus on the presentation. Right. So the output of the sequencing machine really vary in size, as I mentioned. We can call them short reads. The output, this each segment of this sequencing machine, we call it a read. The output can be short if it is 100 to, let's say, 500 long pieces. That is short reads. And we have long reads, which is somewhere between 300 bases all the way to 2 million or 2 point something million long sequences. And we got recently uh, a very nice, very high quality output, which we call high fi read, high fidelity read, where we do the consensus of the read. So we overlap the reads together so that we can increase the confidence and correct the errors if we find them by using many read overlapping to each other. And these hi-fi reads are still uh, not as long as the long reads. So they are in average somewhere between 10 to 20,000 uh, bases. However, their accuracy is really high, but they are still expensive. So the cheapest uh, price per read is the short reads until now. That's why it's uh, commonly used, widely used everywhere, but also uh, they have their own shortcomings, such as they are very short. So if we have a disease with very long gaps, like deletion or insertions in the genome, it will be very hard to discover these uh, causes of disease if we use short reads. So we cannot say which one is better until now. Each has its own advantages and limitations. All right, so to solve the problem that is introduced by the sequencing machine that we are unable to read the full genome, we try to solve this problem as a puzzle. So we got the reference genome, <coughs> the picture we use over here. We got the pieces from the sequencing machine that are the reads, and then we try to stick them together. So we try to guess what is the location of every single piece coming from the sequencing machine. OK, how about the data? Where we can get these data? So either you do the sequencing yourself, you could get it as a, serv a service, or you can get it from publicly available databases. For example, the reference genome, uh, from this link you can access it. This is the header of the file where you can see it is just uh, two lines format. The first line is the, uh, the, um, the ID of the genome or the chromosome you are reading, and the rest of the lines are the content of that reference genome, the 3.2 billion characters. They can be scattered uh, over multiple chromosomes or as a single line. All right, how about the reads? We got them from the sequencing machine. Again, these reads are also publicly available if you wish. Uh, here's an example. If you change the accession number at the end of the link, then you will get different read set. Uh, here, for example, you can get more information about the machine was used for sequencing. This is Olomina, it means short reads. And this is the size, this is the file where you can access it. Okay, so assume we have the FASTA file and the FASTQ file. FASTA is the reference genome, the FASTQ is the read dataset, and the FASTQ file is four line format. So the first line is the, the header or the ID of the read, and then the second line, the read itself. As you can see over here, I hope you can see my cursor. So the, the, the second line is ACGT content, the third line, you can ignore it, and the fourth line is the quality of every base in ASCII code. So E here represent a number where what is our confidence about T or the confidence of the sequencing machine when it was sequencing the T. OK, so the problem now, we want to locate the second line of the FASTAQ file over the FASTA file. So what is the best location where we can get or we guess what is the location that we got from the FASTA file? To do that, we use a common way to search large files, which is indexing. So you need to index the FASTA file, the largest content or the largest text, and then you use that index to look for small pieces of the FASTQ file. How is that possible? So assume we store these pieces in a hash table. Whenever we have a piece, it means only we record these pieces in the hash table along with their first character location. And then we do the same for the second line. We got the read content and these pieces and try to match them to the pieces we got from the FASTA file. So 
as you can see, if you want to respect the order, uh, for example, the blue content here, followed by green and then followed by red, that is exactly the same way how we have it in this FASTA file. So we have the blue piece over there, followed by the green and followed by the red. So we guess that this read is coming from that location. Of course, you may ask, what if we got multiple location with the same quality, with the same number of matches? Either we report all of them or we try to use another sophisticated method to compare pairwise. So character to character until we do fine tuning to the sequence and then we can pick the one with the highest confidence or what we call alignment score. All right, so this entire process, we call it read mapping, as you can guess from the name. When we do analysis to the bottlenecks in read mapping and try to accelerate it, as this is a well-known practice in the hardware um, accelerator design or in electric engineering. So we say, we really observe that the, the, the sequencing machine doing really well. So it can sequence 48 human genome in about only two days. That is the highest throughput machine we have, Nova 6, 6000. However, when we try to analyze the output coming from the sequencing machine, it really took us uh, to process single human genome only in about 32 CPU hours using 48 uh, CPU core. So it's really heavy workload. Imagine if you want to analyze the entire population of Emirates, it will take really years. Of course, you can use the clusters, you can use cloud computing, but that is again waste of energy to do so. All right, so again, what is the need of this for this peak? So the first thing is that imagine about we having multiple individuals and we have small portions of the DNA and we know that all of them have something in common that is a disease and we want to guess what is the cause for that disease. Of course, we need half of the, 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 the population or the samples to be healthy from that disease and the other half as um, uh, holding that disease. So if, if you are very smart enough to figure out what is the cause for the disease, you can see all of them very similar to each other, except two columns. So we have this column, which we call it uh, single nucleotide polymorphism, uh, or in short, SNP. In SNP1, you can see they are common in half of it, and the other half really different. In the other column, which is SNP2, it's really random. So if you try to correlate it to blood pressure, you cannot get any useful information. But if you look at the SNP1, you will see that whenever the individual is healthy from blood pressure or high blood pressure, he has a T in, in this location. Otherwise, he has a C or she. Uh, so we can, uh, we can guess that the cause for high blood pressure is correlated to this location when, whenever you have a C in, in your DNA. If you think about that only disease can cause by single alteration the DNA, that is wrong because in these disease such as autism and obesity, uh, you have a huge deletions or insertion in your DNA, which is 500,000 bases deleted from your DNA or inserted as addition to your chromosomes. And that is a huge, again, problem to be discovered, especially if you are using short reads, for example. This is another example where you can access this open source database, opensnap.org, uh, where you can go to specific locations in the genome. For example, here tell you at chromosome 19, at this specific position in that chromosome, if you got a T from the mother and T from the father, then you have about 20 to 25% that if you got hepatitis C, then you it's really very low probability to respond to treatment. So 20, 20 to 25 percent uh, that you may get better to medication. However, if you get the C from mother, C from father in that specific location in chromosome 19, then the probability will be much higher, 80 percent that you will get uh, responded to the treatment. And that's what we call personalized medicine. So I need to read your DNA first, get the content of the DNA, do some analysis to correlate it to certain disease, look in these open access databases and try to figure out what is the probability of getting better and what medica medication you should get so that you can get better. 
it's not about only knowledge inference, but rather about getting better much quicker so that you'll be in safe hands. So if you think about critically ill infants, they have few days to uh, get better. Otherwise, they may pass away right, away, right after that. So the, the personalized medicine or whole genome analysis, if it can perform in two days, it will be a costly option, but very quick. Although two days is not as quick as you can think, or if you cannot afford the cost, you may get five day analyses to analyze your DNA, and then you get what medication uh, this infant might get better uh, compared to. So either you do analysis very quick and you pay a huge amount of money, or you want to pay less and you get the analysis in five days, which is really very long. And it's already proven clinically that doing whole genome analysis for critically ill infants in a quick way, it will avoid morbidity, reduce hospital stay and hospital cost significantly. And you can refer to these uh, references. All right. So now, hopefully, I already motivate you to do very quick analysis for our DNA and try to get the best out of it uh, using algorithm or hardware so that you can uh, really benefit a uh, human being and save some lives. And this is the case in UK. They start from 2019. Whenever they have critically N, L children, um, then they, they need to do the analysis for them right away without even uh, checking uh, the, the case or whatever uh, the disease with them. The first thing they do, whole genome sequencing. So imagine how heavy workload they have, especially about how many uh, critically ill children uh, came to the same hospital. Then you need to do some scalable analysis. It's not about how a single analysis will take, but how many analysis you can do per day for all these children. All right, so there are also some initiatives and studies, very few actually, to do to try to understand what kind of viruses we have per city. So we have this huge uh, study that targets 60 cities around the world. We get around 5,000 samples from everywhere, train stations, universities, gardens, and so on. And they try to see what, what kind of viruses we have. Think about if we want to do it per street or per city, per country, for the entire world, even in space, and so on. We still can see very huge workload if we want to target ocean, uh, agriculture, and so on. And there are many more applications where you need very fast analysis. And by the way, we have a grant proposal together with Professor Becker on this topic. So hopefully we get it in, and then we can start working on this together very soon. OK, so now, now we introduce the topic. We introduce the need for very fast analysis, but we still we don't know what makes this analysis very slow or taking two days or five days. The first thing is very heavy workload. We have a huge amount of data generated every single hours by sequencing machine or available on publicly available databases. And until now, we're still using a specialized machine for sequencing, but we are using general purpose computer for the analysis, which is very slow and we cannot cope with, the, with the, whatever throughput we got from the sequencing machine. If we look at the general purpose computer we are using, still following the von Neumann model, which is a well-known model for the computer stack that was proposed in 1945, where we separate the data storage from the processing. So we need to go to the storage, fetch the data all the way to main memory, to the caches, and then do the processing at the CPU side. So data analysis is really performed far away from the data or where the data resides in the memory or in storage. And that caused a huge performance bottleneck due to data movement. So single memory request going from the processor to the main memory uh, consumes about more or, or at least 160x more energy compared to performing a complex addition operation at the CPU side. So think about a more complex applications such as genome analysis where we want to perform it at the CPU and we still have a huge amount of data that even cannot fit into our main memory where we have round trips of data movement 
and that will take about 40% to 60% of the overall energy bottleneck in the system. If we do deeper analysis to one of the algorithms used for read mapping, then we, this is the breakdown for the time analysis. And you will see about more than 60% of the time is just spent on dynamic programming algorithm, which is used to do fine tuning alignment or pairwise alignment between two sequences, between two genomic sequences. So we check every character, whether it can be deletion, insertion, or substitution. And that is very expensive, even with the state of the art algorithm that is widely used until now. Why is that? Here is a paper for you. Uh, this is um, um, this is a mathematical uh, proof of that we cannot do better than dynamic programming algorithm or quadratic time uh, algorithm to compute or to solve the same problem, which is pairwise alignment. So you cannot do um, uh, in term of time complexity better than quadratic time algorithm. If we look also about, if you remember when I show you the FASTQ file and the FASTA file where we compare them together. So 98% of the time, the, the way we compare the FASTQ file to the FASTA file, they really differ because we use very short pieces from the read to uh, match with the reference genome. So most of the time we don't get a good head. Most of the location that we figure out using the index, they have high, dis high uh, dissimilarity uh, with the, re the read sequence. So if you want to use the dynamic programming table to check the alignment in a fine tuning manner, you will suffer a lot because you will use it most of the time and then you will waste the computation because you will not use it. It's not useful for you. So only 2% of the time, whenever you use the dynamic programming table, you will get a useful output. So one of the efficient way to look at the problem or try to tackle that problem is to look at the compute stack. So we have at the bottom the hardware where we have the logic, transistor, devices, and so on. And at the bottom, we have the data itself and then the algorithm and then the implementation, and then the operating system. And if you try to tackle it from one way, you will lose the game always. So if you try to improve the data using data compression and so on, the, the algorithm is still very expensive. In the same way, if you look at the algorithm, the hardware to be implemented is still very expensive because general purpose computing and not dedicated to do genome analysis. So the, the best way to look at the problem is to tackle it from the top and from the bottom to change the hardware itself and to change the algorithm to make it hardware friendly. And if you look at the software only, so we have this is a well-known problem, matrix multiplication. And if you try to optimize it using software, you'll see that if you move from Python to C and then to SIMD or AVX acceleration, you will gain about 60,000 X speed up. This is the reference where you can get this data and the code, run it yourself and try out. Also, if you look at just reading the genomic data, the FASTQ file, just read the FASTQ file. If you read it in C, you will see at least 4x speed up compared if you read it using Python. That is a huge speed up. So if you try to write an algorithm to read genomic data or to do whatever processing, don't use Python. That is a huge workload to be processed and you need to go as low as possible to C or SIMD acceleration or to assembly if needed for some of the microprocessor. Of course, there is a trade-off here. But as you can see from this motivational data, um, we need to handle this workload very efficiently. All right, in summary, we need intelligent algorithm and intelligent architectures that really handle the data very well. So if you don't customize the algorithm to the hardware, and if you don't build hardware for that algorithm, you will lose the game again, as I said. And this is what we are trying to do in our group. And next, I'm going through several works that we published recently, try to tackle the same problem. And here is multiple uh, very famous genome analysis pipelines that if you are interested in accelerating, you need to look at these steps, starting from base calling. And base calling is really technology dependent. So we have currently three uh, prominent technology for sequencing, Alumina, Oxford Nanopore, and PacBio. Each of them produce really different, totally different outputs. 
and this row output, for example, ONT is electrical signal, and you need to translate the electrical signal into genomic data or a text as ACGT. But in Alumina, we have pictures out of the machine. So we have images coming from the machine, and we need to convert the images into ACGT data. The same thing with PacBio. And for different species, we really get different content, different uh, read length, and uh, different uh, error profile, as well as uh, the coverage. So all these are different properties of the sequencing machine, depending on the configuration of the user, as well as the machine you are using. So once you get the read set, as I said, there are different properties, different length, and so on. You may do read correction, or you may not. It's up to you. And then you have the reference genome because you need to compare the reads or each read coming from the machine to a very long reference genome. You may perform indexing or sketching. Each of these techniques are used to look for very large text as in reference genome. Then we do read mapping, which is the thing I was explaining. Then you could do taxonomy profiling, and here we have multiple tools. And then the assembly, variant calling, and if you have de novo assembly, you could do polishing to the, the, the output. And we have multiple tools from our group doing that. So we look at different stage of this pipeline and try to accelerate some of them. And, and currently we are focusing on accelerating the entire pipeline within a single hardware piece. We have this uh, review uh, on the all these steps, try to see what are the existing hardware accelerators, uh, what are the uh, uh, efficiencies of these uh, tools, as well as the limitation, and we try to bridge them in our work as well. So if we look at the uh, sequencing stack or the analysis stack, we have the sequencing machine storing the data in SSD and then to the main memory, to the caches, to the CPU. And we try to tackle different stage of this uh, hardware um, stack. So we have specialized pre-alignment filtering on FPGA and GPUs as accelerators. We also have some work in memory and near memory to do the processing for genomic data. We also recently have a work to do the processing inside the SSD, which I'm going to briefly cover and refer you to the paper, which will be uh, out soon in a week or so. So for the first work, that is a pre-alignment filter. We call it Sneaky Snake. And the key idea here is that we observe that genomic strings either similar to each other or highly dissimilar. So if you compare a read to a reference genome, you may find a lot of strings that really completely different from each other. And we, nor we normally use a threshold to say if this is similar or dissimilar. So we normally use 5% of the read length. So if the read length is 100, then we allow only for five differences between the two strings. And if they are more than five, then we call it dissimilar string. And if we have a dissimilar string, then we need to ignore them because they are not useful for us or for clinical interpretation. However, if they are similar, then we need to find the number and the number of the uh, differences, the location of the differences and the type of these differences, whether they are insertion, deletion or substitutions. So we said, OK, the similar strings are really expensive to compute because whatever computation we perform on these dissimilar strings is going to be wasted because we will not use it at, at the end of the day. So we said, OK, let's develop a filter that try to figure out these dissimilar strings and remove them very quickly without using dynamic programming algorithm. So if you look at this, this is a huge dynamic programming table where a dot represents a similarity, whether it's red or blue dot, it's the same thing. It's similarity between the two uh, sequences. This is the huge sequence, and this is another huge sequence, and we compare them together. If you look. Uh, from the top view about the similarity between the two sequences, you will see the similarity is scattered around the diagonal, the main diagonal of the dynamic programming matrix. So that gives us uh, uh, a very good observation and motivation to develop the filter that always detect whether you have a path around the main diagonal or not. It's not necessarily should be the main diagonal itself, it could be the diagonal next to it or far from it by a threshold. So if you have the, 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 the similarity around here, then that is an indication that you have very high uh, dissimilarity. And this is what we develop in our work that we call Sneak Snake again. And we enter a problem that is called single net routing problem in VLSI chip. 
how is this similar to the dynamic programming uh, matrix problem I was explaining? This is a picture of the, the VLSI chip. If you dissect it and go through it, uh, so you will see several components inside. And do you, the problem now, you wanted to have one pen dedicated for the input and another pen dedicated for the output. The problem is that you want always to be around the path, which is straight line from this pen all the way to that pen. That is the main diagonal for you. Whenever you detour from that main diagonal, then you are going to consume more wires and that will be more expensive for you. And that will be very similar to the edit distance problem or the dynamic programming table problem I was explaining. So whenever you detour to another path, then you consume one edit. If you uh, detour again to another path, that is two edits or two differences between the genomic sequences. And this is exactly what we did. So we built a matrix based on this equation explained in our paper, based on the two genomic sequences. And this is the matrix, and this is the threshold we use. How far you want to be from the main diagonal of the dynamic programming table. This is user configured. So we set it to three. Now we convert each one into an obstacle or a module inside the VLSI chip, where you need to detour from that module. So the zero will be a vacant space where you can uh, detour or you can uh, cross it, but the one will be the black boxes where you need to detour from it. So here's the entrance. You are free to choose whatever row to go through, and this is the exit, and you are free to go whenever a row you want up from the exit side. So we have the snake and want to go through this maze. So you start row by row, you check how many steps you can go uh, forward. And you can see at this row, you have four steps to move forward. Once you reach that obstacle, you need to, to detour. So you need to check what is the next row that I can follow. So you check how many steps I have. Of course, now, since you face an obstacle, you reduce the threshold from three to two. And now you check again for each row, how many steps you can go further. You can see that this is the, 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 the path that you really need to follow. And you can see we always try to stick around the center line, which is the main diagonal for us. Whenever we detour as here, we deduct, we deduct an obstacle from the threshold as one. And here we deduct an obstacle from the threshold again as two edit operations. So we have here uh, the row. Again, we repeat the steps until we reach the exit. If we don't reach while having the threshold uh, above zero or equal to zero, then that means the two genomic sequences we use to build the matrix are really dissimilar from each other. All right. In fact, when we build this matrix, we don't build it as this shape. But what we do whenever we face an obstacle in the first place in each row, then we don't continue to do computation. So actually what we build is this, not the previous one. So you can see here, whenever we have an obstacle, we don't compute anything. Whenever we have an obstacle, don't compute. Until you don't have an obstacle, continue building until you reach an obstacle. So you can see we save a lot of resources and we are much faster even using a basic CPU implementation once we implement this using C code. So it's really much faster than all the existing method to do sequence alignment. We implement this in FPGA, in GPU, and oh, it's really very low resources required to implement single instance on FPGAs. And we got a huge speed up uh, in terms of energy, in terms of speed up. And for the results, I refer you to the paper. And however, we still suffer from one problem, that we need to move the data from the main memory to these accelerators, right? So we said, OK, we implement an FPGA and GPUs, and we use also CPUs, but how about doing the processing inside the memory itself to save moving the data back and forth between these components? So we try to accelerate Sneaky Snake and other, and other applications in this paper, very recent, uh, in a few months back. And the problem is that read mapping is heavily bottlenecked by data movement from the main memory to this accelerator using PCI Express. So we said, let's perform read mapping near where the data resides. We carefully redesigned the sneak snake logic 
and try to build it inside um, FPGA where it's coupled with a high bandwidth memory in the same package. So you have minimal data movement between the HPM uh, cube and the FPGA logic. And for that, we use two setup, one FPGA with DDR4, another FPGA with HPM, and uh, we use uh, IBM Power9 a system to do the integration. And the, the, the results we got really significant compared to all the accelerators we use, even to DDR4 traditional FPGAs. You can see here the, the, the runtime and the energy efficiencies we got over there, over multiple number of instances or ports for the HPM. That is for the sneaky snake. Now we have another work called Gram filter that also try to do processing inside the memory, but using a new representation of the data. The key observation we made, again, similar to the latest work we did, that FPGA and GPU accelerators are heavily bottlenecked by data movement. And the key idea here is to exploit the high memory bandwidth and the logic layer of the 3D stacked memory to perform highly parallel filtering. And we got significant results compared to other implementations. Uh, if you're interested, please check the paper. Um, this is more details about the implementation. This is the 3D stacked memory where we have multiple layers of DRAM, and the last layer is the logic layer where you can perform computation. So if you want to get the best out of this architecture, you need to enable um, the, the high throughput access to the data where you can fetch data uh, much quicker and with high parallelism to all the logic you have in the logic layer. So if you want to have multiple instances, then each instance will access the entire vault to get the data quickly. Then you will have uh, as much as you can fit in the logic layer instances, and each instance work really independently from all others where it can access the data quickly. And we said, OK, let's uh, change the representation of the data to make it very friendly to this architecture so that we can access more data uh, as we can. Uh, so uh, these more uh, details about the DRAM, I hope everyone is aware about all these terms. So I'm going quickly over them. Let's skip them. All right, let's go to the representation of the data, which is more interesting if you are looking for more details about genomic data. So for the reference genome, we split it into bins, which is array that represent that bin. So we can have bit vector representing the data rather than the data itself. And we said, OK, the bin is actually just binary array, 0 or 1. 0 means that seed exists. Uh, one means uh, the seed exists, and zero means does not exist. So uh, we enumerate all possible values of five characters. So we're starting from A, 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 five A's, all the way to five T's. Just enumerate all possible value. And then you can guess um, how large this could be, which is four to the power five, right? Because each character can be A or C or G or T. And uh, we have these binary details based on whether this seed exists in this bin or not. Doesn't matter how many times it exists, as long as it exists once, then we record it as one. And that is how we represent the reference genome as a bet vector. And then we use that bet vector uh, to be stored in the 3D stack memory so we can access it with high throughput. And now we get do the same for the read sequence. This is the read, and that band for the reference genome, it's already stored in the uh, layer of DRAM. And then we got the read. We try to get k-mers from the read and then build, an, again, a bit vector for the read and then match it with the bit vector we have for the reference. If the sum of ones uh, exceed or equal to a threshold of uh, the bit vector we have for the reference genome, then that means both of them are similar because they are share nearly um, the same amount of these seeds. And if so, then we said these are similar sequences. We need to perform now sequence alignment or dynamic programming algorithm. But if they are not similar, then just ignore them and you already save a huge computation of the dynamic programming algorithm. That is what we call Gram filter. For more details, please refer to the paper. We have the source code, everything open source as usual. All the tools we have from our group publicly available, whether they are FPGA, GPU, C, whatever, they are all on GitHub.
All right. This is again another recent work published in Micro, the end of the 2020, and we call it Genasm. Our goal here is to do the acceleration, not for filtering only, but also for filtering and sequence alignment and the dynamic programming algorithm itself. So we want to accelerate approximate string matching by designing fast and flexible framework, which can accelerate multiple steps of genome sequence analysis. The key idea is to exploit the high memory bandwidth and the logic layer of 3D stack memory to perform highly parallel uh, sequence alignment in the DRAM chip itself. So we have three key ideas. The first one is to modify and extend an existing very old algorithm that never been used for sequence alignment after it was proposed because it has some limitation. And that algorithm, we call it BITAP, was proposed in 1992. And we enabled that algorithm to support first long reads because it's very important for the state of the art sequencing technology, support trace back where you can go through the uh, dynamic programming table after you build it, and you try to infer what are the location of each edit. You want to know where's the location of the edit and what type of location uh, of edit you have, whether it's insertion or or deletion or substitutions. And we make it highly parallelizable by uh, hardware accelerating it and uh, um, do, having multiple instances uh, to do the acceleration. And then we co-design it with the hardware along with these algorithmic optimizations. And we have multiple use cases in the paper, starting with read alignment or sequence alignment, and then pre-alignment filtering, similar to sneak snake and grim filter and then edit distance calculation. The difference between edit distance calculation and read alignment is that you are not interested in knowing the location or the type of the edit, but rather just knowing the edit distance, which is the minimum number of edit operation that you can afford between the two sequences to make them similar. That is a bit cheaper than the sequence alignment because you don't do uh, trace back. And the, again, the, the results we got really significant even compared to hardware acceleration or chip uh, dedicated to do the sequence alignment, such as Darwin and GeneX. And uh, for more results, again, I'm going to refer you to the original paper to read it in details. All right, so after we develop a large amount of work on GPU, FPGA accelerators, or even in-memory, near-memory acceleration, we observe that we always still suffer from data movement coming from the storage, not from the main memory. So we try to solve the issue coming from the main memory or near-memory acceleration, but we said, how about the storage? We still have a huge amount of data, especially if the FASTQ file is really huge, as the case in most of the uh, genome pipelines. So we said, OK, let's develop something uh, inside the storage itself, inside the SSD. And we have this, which will be presented in a week from now, or 10 days, actually, in S Plus in Lausanne, Switzerland. And we call this work GenStore, High Performance in Storage Processing System for gen Genome Sequence Analysis. And uh, what we do here, as I mentioned, we try to do the processing inside the storage. And again, as in all our works, we don't develop hardware accelerators only, but we try to tweak the algorithm first, propose totally new algorithm that will change the story and make it very friendly to the hardware. And then we build hardware accelerator for the algorithm that we develop. We observe, we make two key observations in this work. First, we see that whenever you use short reads, then there are large portion of these short reads exactly matched to the reference genome without any changes. So there are no differences, no edit operation. So they are exactly matched as they are to the reference genome. So we said, let's have very cheap hardware detect these reads. And then if they are exactly matched, then done. You don't need to compute anything in the CPU side or inside the memory because there's zero edit. So you can just have the output as zero edit for that read and done. And that is for short reads. Uh, by the way, the exact match observation is not ours. There are existing multiple work starting from 2015 all the way uh, with different ratio depends on the technology and the read type and so on. But this is the first hardware accelerator to tackle this problem inside the SSD. There are some work like GenCache, for example, try to do the processing near the cache. However, 
we also made a very new observation about long reads. So we saw we observed that for long reads, they share large amount of pieces with the referent genome if they are similar to these location the referent gene. So they have what we call seeds or subsequences shared between the two sequences. And these seeds, uh, they will be very large in quantity if this read is similar to the referent genome. And we develop another hardware accelerator for these long reads so that we have a complete system, whatever the read type is, short or long, hi-fi and so on, uh, where you can process these inside the SSD. And one of them, operate on the good reads, which is exactly match. The other one operate on the bad reads, these non-matching, that they don't share large amount of seeds between the read and the referent genome. And the, the, the results we got from this acceleration is really huge, uh, especially that we save a huge amount of data movement by filtering 70% of the short reads, for example, from being processed in the CPU. So we store them back in the storage as they are good reads. And then up to you, the user, if you want to load them to the main memory, you do some further op operation on them. And by the way, each sequencing machine has inside it either FPGA or GPU and also an SSD. So you can do the processing inside the machine itself without any need to move the data outside this component. So you have processing inside the edge device itself. Again, the work will be available on GitHub, on YouTube, on uh, all our channels uh, very soon in a week or so if you're interested in the paper, but I'll be happy to share the draft uh, if you're interested so. Okay, so I present a few of the works that we develop in our group. How about the adoption of these hardware accelerators in real uh, genome analysis setup, for example, clinical setup or hospitals or even startups, companies and so on? Uh, I don't know what happened. I hope you can still see my slides. Yeah, we still see your slide. OK, great. Yeah. All right. So yeah, back to 2016 when we published the first hardware accelerator for filtering algorithm, that is Gatekeeper, which I didn't present today. But there was one interesting comment we got from the reviewer that time. We published in Bioinformatics Journal and we got six reviewers. And the reviewer was honest and clear to the point. He said, there has been little to no adoption of previous specialized hardware solution related to improving the speed of alignment. So he was commenting on the adoption of the work and he said, I have a major concern with the work that is actually not a problem with the manuscript. Our response was uh, as clear as he was, and we said it always takes time to adopt a new or different hardware technology. So we we're developing for FPGA and nobody was using actual FPGA for genome analysis in that time, and it was odd uh, for the community. So we said, okay, uh, and we have very long response for him uh, with a few examples and so on. And we were at that time a dreamer, but however, you need to dream and everything will come uh, later on. So computing landscape, if you look at it 10 or 20 years ago, it's really very different from what we have these days. And this is true for genome analysis. So two years later, after we developed the hardware accelerator, the genome sequencing companies start to have or to adopt FPGA accelerators inside their machine to do some analysis. And this is true for Dragon, for example, which is implemented in FPGA. And also we have NVIDIA processor or uh, Parabrix, so which, is, which is a GPU-based accelerator, uh, which was developed as a startup in 2018, and then NVIDIA acquired that startup to do the processing. And as you can see, most of the actual hardware implemented in these existing genome analysis uh, companies is still using GPU and FPGAs, which they really suffer from data movement and energy inefficiencies. So moving forward, uh, how that will be uh, possible in the future. So if you look at the genome analysis or analyzing our DNA much quicker, it's not just enabling disease-based analyses or hospital use cases, but rather a use cases in really different thing in our life. 
For example, this is a work from ETH Zurich where they try to do DNA storage, where you store information in a DNA or artificial DNA component that can be melted down as a bunny, for example, or sunglasses. This sunglasses inside the glass, it's embedded DNA component or the molecule of the DNA, which encode data. For example, you can represent A as two bits, C again, two bits of data, and you change these two bits based on the data you have. 0, 0, for example, is A, 0, 1 is C, 1, 0 is G, and so on. And you can encode whatever data you want over there, and then uh, have it as a DNA molecule or artificial DNA, which can last for thousands or millions of years. It will be nowhere out as we have in our uh, storage technologies these days. And this is already published in Nature Biotechnology. We have also totally different application than what we are talking about today. For example, uh, personalized shopping experience. So you have your DNA analyzed and based on your DNA, it, they can tell you whether this food product is suitable for your DNA or not. It might, it might cause you allergy or something like that. So based on your DNA, you can do the shopping yourself. And for that, you also need to do hardware acceleration so you can get the decision really quick uh, uh, than what you need. There are also some applications to understand the gut microbiome, what kind of viruses or bacteria living inside your body so that you can do further uh, diet or uh, health improvement. And this is a startup called Unseen Bio, where you also need a hardware acceleration for that so you can do the analysis quicker um, and, uh, and so on. So the countries start themselves as initiatives to do genome analysis for the population. So each of these countries start to build genetic map to know what kind of disease the citizens have and what kind of personalized medicine that they can enable inside the hospital. So Saudi Arabia has this very long program since I think 10 years or so, Qatar as well. Emirates started starting, uh, I think, uh, air late last year. I think around mid uh, 2021, it's never too late. Uh, it's starting better than not starting. They have uh, ambitious program to sequence a million a citizen and get their genetic map and then do analysis on that. So you can think about the huge workload to do this analysis for a million individual or even targeting the entire population. So at the end, what if we have a machine that give you the full sequence of DNA. So we are we're talking in the beginning of the talk that there is no existing machine that can give you the full sequence of DNA. But what do we, we have one? Will all these hardware accelerators that we develop will be trashed away? Think about other applications such as whole genome alignment, metagenomics, and pangenomics, where we on all these applications, we compare a full genome to a full genome. So we do genome to genome comparison and we try to get the differences between them. That is not related to the sequencing machine. It will be really independent from whatever technology we have. And then whatever hardware accelerator you develop to compare genome to genome will never be outdated. And we still have open question, how and where to enable fast, accurate, cheap, also privacy preserving because this data can tell much more than what you think about yourself and relatives. And we also want this analysis to be scalable, exabyte scale analyses of genomic data. We have different components for the analysis or for the entire pipeline, and we need to figure out where to place the processing, whether inside the sequencing machine, near the storage, uh, near memory, and so on. There is no one solution fit all cases, so it depends on really in the data, how much filtering you can do, whether you want to do the filtering inside the storage and the processing at the CPU, and so on. So there is no one solution that can solve this problem. As a key conclusion of this talk, most speed up comes from parallelism enabled by both novel architectures and algorithms as well. And uh, we have multiple papers. If you are new to this topic, hopefully that can introduce you well to the topic. Uh, and we have this recent paper uh, covering all aspects of read alignment in different applications. We got very good positive feedback from the committee, uh, from the community of the genomics about this. So if you're interested, please check the paper. 
We have multiple videos on our YouTube channel and lectures from me, Professor Anur Mutlu, and other members of the group. We have also multiple courses that I'm teaching every semester on the on the on these topics and the use of hardware accelerators. So all are publicly available in terms of materials, videos, and so on. Uh, that is all for the talk. I'm happy to take questions if you have any. Great, thank you very much. Enjoy the talk. So I know uh, Dr. Andreas needs to leave. He has a question. Can you read the question? What's it? It's in the. Oh, I can see it. Yes. So Dr. Andreas asking, I'm curious how uh, borrow wheat or in uh, transform state of the art in reads mapping algorithms can benefit your algorithms. That's a very good question, actually. So there are state-of-the-art tools called uh, BWA MAM2 that use Burroughs Wheeler transformation as indexing method. And actually, whatever coming after the indexing, like uh, chaining, filtering, sequence alignment, all of them are independent of the index you use. So you can still use hash table, for example, and then follow up with the sequence aligner, dynamic programming table algorithm, and so on. So all of these can still reuse whatever we have developed in our group. For example, the sequence aligner, Genasm, or uh, all the other method we develop, you can replace the sequence aligner inside BWA MAM2 to do this. And we already did this in some of our works, and we proved that we got some speed up if you do the integration between them. We also integrated with Minimap2, which is using totally different indexing method, that is hash table, not Burr's Wheeler transformation. And we also proved some speed up compared to that. And the speed up was really significant in case of Genasm and GenStore, as well as Sneak Snake in terms of filtering. So you have seed chaining, you have filtering, and you have a sequence aligner that you can integrate with these existing method, regardless of the indexing you use. That was a very good question. Okay, great. Anyone else has a question? You can speak or you can type your question. I know we're almost uh, on the hour, but it was an enjoyable hour. Thank you so much. Yeah, I was thinking it's one hour and a half, right? So we have uh, about a few minutes for the question. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Do you have guys have any question? I have a general question in like in the slides, very interesting. You showed like blood pressure, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, who would mark this data? I mean, you at the end, you need somebody who uh, will get you like mark data that we uh, later on you can uh, utilize, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question, actually. So we have a study called GWAS study, a genome wide association studies. In these studies, you have two samples, two large group samples. So you have healthy sample, like 1,000, 10,000 individual, and then another uh, 10,000 people where they don't have the disease. And then if you want to mark the data, so you compare these individual together, and then you have these very specific location where they differ. They do, you do Manhattan plots, and then you get the significant differences between the individuals. And then you have very high confidence to know whether this these individual have this disease or not. For blood pressure, it's very easy to do the symptoms before you do the testing. So doctors can check if that individual has high blood pressure disease or not, right? So you can re really identify this easily, uh, that this group is healthy or not then you can have a very clear sample or very, uh, let's say, very good sample for your study. But for some other disease, it's really hard to figure out whether you have that disease or not. Although you may have the genetic variation, but you may not observe the disease itself. So you may pass it to the second generation, but not you having that disease. And that will cause some uh, problem with the GWAS studies. That was that. That is why we have another study called TWAS study, transcriptome-wide association study. In these studies, we have more fine tuning by combining other data rather than just the DNA. So we can have RNA or protein and then transcriptomes and then do the analysis and comparison between a healthy sample and the other sample that hold the single disease or multiple disease actually. I see. OK, so we got two questions, one from Iftikhar saying which algorithm or which best algorithm to use for SNPS analysis? 
for the single nucleotide polymorphism, actually, uh, you can use Hamming distance, which is very cheap to compute. Uh, you don't really need heavy computation. And there are two tools using that. Uh, let me just go over the pipelines I was presenting. Mm, yeah, over here. Uh, can you see the slides now? Yes, the genome, we are still seeing the genome, uh, Saudi genome slide. Oops, okay, let me share again quickly. How about now? Yeah, we see the several genome analysis pipeline. Right, so um, the question you get about the read mapping. So in read mapping, you have two tools that use uh, Hamming distance as sequence aligner. Although Hamming distance is not good for detecting insertions and deletions, as you know, it's used in error detection and error correction. It is very good to uh, recognize substitutions, which are the case for single nucleotide polymorphism or for SNPs. So whenever you have just one character tweaked to another character in the genomic sequence, you can use Hamming distance to do that. Uh, for this, you can use MISFAST Ultra, which is the current state of the art for using Hamming distance uh, as sequence aligner. MISFAST Ultra, which was developed by my PhD advisor. I'm not biased, but this is really <laughs> the best algorithm to be used. Okay. And it's actually very efficient to be hardware accelerators. I'm not aware of any hardware accelerators do the acceleration for this algorithm. Okay. Uh, another question from Hiba. Any new accurate uh, genome sequencing and related things? How can I enroll the full? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay, so clinical very uh, any new accurate approach for clinical variant classification and pathog pathogenicity. So again, the accuracy is always questionable. We cannot say this is really hundred percent accurate or not because we still don't know um, the full story about our genomes. Whatever we do research, still there are missing pieces because until now we are using single reference genome for the entire world. And that creates a lot of biases because we are comparing our reads to that reference genome, which we don't know whether it's representing all disease we have, all the healthiness we have, and all the population we have. That is not the case in most of the cases. That's why there are recently a lot of research on developing a population specific reference genome. For example, there are a lot of studies showing that African. Uh, have 10% more DNA than all the other population. So they have 10% longer genomes than all other European, for example, Asian and so on. So it will be not as good as if you compare with a single reference genome. So the accuracy is questionable. I cannot say which one is most accurate, but we always have ground truth. So we know the disease, we know the correlation to this disease, and then we compare to this ground truth and we say whether we can detect this variation or not. Uh, you can check Minimap2, for example, but still it has uh, serious issues about detecting very large insertions or deletions. That's why we have um, a new work, try to integrate NGMLR with Minimap2 and see what are the specific cases where we can detect larger variation or even small variation. But again, Minimap2 doesn't work well for short reads. So we have BWA MAM2 uh, for short reads. So really for each case, tell me what is the data? Uh, what is the accuracy you want? The, the range of read length, the edit distance threshold, and then you have really very specific tool tweak for that problem. There is no single tool best for all the analysis. So I have, I provide here examples of the tool for each step where you can figure out. Um, but uh, yeah, I can tell what is the fastest pipeline, but again, the accuracy is questionable and the accuracy is not one metric. There is precision, there is recall, there is false positive, false negative, and so on. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Iman is asking on the hardware level, you mentioned different hardware accelerators like FPGA, stacking DRAM and uh, NMC or in uh, SSD. Which one give the fastest result uh, for uh, read mapping? Very good question. Uh, comparing all the pieces together, looking at the full picture, um, uh, it's really hard to tell. But for GenStore, we have uh, observed a really large speed up, 
let me go through the results. And we compare to all existing work as well. For example, uh, in GenStore, we don't do sequence aligner. We don't do filtering uh, per se as chaining. So we do only filtering in the first stage. Yeah, I'm almost there. Yeah. Yeah, what we do in gen store or processing inside the storage is filtering the read set itself, but not doing read mapping, the actual read mapping. We do kind of read mapping for exactly matching reads. When we know that this read is exactly matching, then we output as zero uh, uh, edits for these pairs, but there are still other parts of the reads that are not processed, which are not exactly matching. Maybe they have one edit, two edits, right? So these still need to be moved to the process and do the read mapping over there. So looking at the picture, I cannot tell what is best, but what I'm sure about is combination of these methods would be best. For example, genasm with GenStore, which are orthogonal to each other, because genasm is performing sequence aligner. It's not filtering the reads or something like that. It's actually the next step after GenStore. And if uh, remember, it's very challenging to do any computation inside the storage. It's not straightforward. You have very limited logic that is used for the controller. It's not for processing. And it's very small uh, piece of uh, logic where you can assume to perform computation. We have a DRAM inside the SSD as well to uh, load some data or to cache some data. And we have multiple SSD uh, chips over there. So the, the amount of computation is really limited. If you want to perform sequence aligner, I don't think it's straightforward. It's doable if you want to integrate FPGA, for example, next to the SSD. I know some startup in Europe here they approach us and they want us to develop a method for their hardware to do a processing next to this SSD. Uh, so it's possible, but it's not straightforward. So we didn't try it out until now to do sequence alignment next to the storage. Uh, so we have Genasm, which is a customized hardware near memory to do that. We have also Sneak Snake to do the filtering after GenStore. So I would say all these pieces separately they are orthogonal to each other. Each of them uh, developed to do this, um, one type of data processing, but if they are combined all together, they will do the full system for you where you do processing over multiple components of the compute stack. That is the best scenario where we can leverage all these processing. Okay, so I just follow on, on this question. So uh, when you say like SSD or in-memory computing, so you assume that uh, you are using existing like infrastructure. You're not changing like the SSD itself. You're just uh, kind of uh, yeah, trying to use around it or like near memory computing, but not really inside the cell itself, right? So uh, the cell itself just to accommodate the data, but you fetch it using the controller of the SSD and then you can do some processing. But again, uh, if you want to implement it in existing SSD, I don't think this is possible. Uh, whatever uh, existing method try to leverage processing near memory or in memory or processing near storage, all of them assume some simulation based method and then they assume some addition overhead to the existing hardware. For us, it's very minimal because, for example, exactly matches just Hamming distance where you can directly very easy to use XOR gates uh, with minimal number of uh, logic to do that operation. Same thing with the next is Bloom filter. Very easy to implement over there, and you can save it inside the SSD and load it as a data. And that would not require a huge overhead. And same thing with processing near memory. So we don't have actual device to do processing near memory until we got Upmem, right? Uh, so Upmem is a French startup where they have actual processing capabilities inside DRAM. It's not the same as the DRAM we have, but at least it's commercialized. We have the actual device. We have uh, recent devices from Samsung as well to do the processing in memory. But before that, it was not possible to do the computation near the existing hardware. And we also need to assume some changes to the hardware to enable this processing. Yes. Okay. Okay, anyone else have any questions? All right. so, uh, I think if no questions, we can, uh, you know, stop here and definitely uh, 
have many questions, but we can take it offline and definitely looking forward to working with you and the team and, uh, you know, exciting, uh, uh, you know, project, exciting things uh, to come, inshallah. Yeah, definitely. We're very motivated to push our collaboration together. And uh, sorry, you couldn't join in person, but uh, hopefully next time we can make it. Inshallah, it will be our uh, honor yeah, to invite, to host you here and to see you in person, inshallah. My great pleasure. Thank you so much, Professor Baker. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming and uh, hopefully you enjoyed the talk as much as I did. And uh, we'll uh, follow up with uh, Dr. Muhammad, in, inshallah. inshallah. All right. Thank you very much. Stop recording.